Life Audio. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? Or have you been in a season where it feels like He's completely silent? Have you been praying for a way to learn how to hear His voice more clearly? Hey friends, I'm Rachel, host of the Hearing Jesus Podcast. If you are ready to grow in your faith and to confidently step into your identity in Christ, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. everyone. Welcome back to the Hearing Jesus podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl. And today we're continuing our devotional Bible study of Matthew chapter 18. We're doing it in the second half today. So if you missed the first half, you can go back and listen to yesterday's episode. And just as a reminder, we have lots of additional resources to help you grow in your faith. If you head to shehears.org, we have Bible studies, we have journals, we have Bible tabs, all sorts of things to help you grow in your walk with the Lord. And so I'm picking up at verse 21. It says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servant. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So there's a couple of things that you may have heard or already known in this passage, but a couple of things that maybe you haven't. First of all, in ancient Judaism, they recognized that when there were repeat offenders, meaning they considered this lifestyle of sin to be okay and they continued to sin over and over again, they basically found that to mean that they were not really repentant at all. And they drew a line at how many times a person could seek forgiveness and restoration for the same thing. They drew the line at three times for the same thing. And so in the Jewish culture, even when Peter says seven times, he found that to probably be really, really generous because typically it would have been three times. And when Jesus responds and he says, not seven times, but 70 times seven, There are some scholars that would read that as 77, but either way, Jesus does not mean specifically 490 times or 77 times, depending on how you look at it. He's talking in hyperbole, and it's essentially a way of saying, just don't hold grudges, forgive people. And it's interesting because this man, remember, this is a story about a Gentile king, not a Jewish king. But this man must have been a significant figure because he owed the king 10 thousand talents. So Josephus recorded what would have happened at the time of the death of Herod the Great. Josephus was a Jewish historian that was alive at the time of when the Bible was being written. And he wrote that the total amount collected from the region was 900 talents. It was just over $220 million in current currency. The amount of money that this man owed the king was $2.5 billion. And so it's an example basically just to say, okay, it was over 10 times as much as all the money that would have been collected in the entire region. It's a dramatic hyperbole. And in fact, that word for 10,000 in the Hebrew meant countless. And so what Jesus is getting at is saying the number doesn't matter. What you have to recognize is this is an unthinkable amount of money that could never have been repaid. And then it goes on to talk about the other servant. Now, 
just remember, this is a Gentile king. And so the way that it would have worked typically in that culture is they would have had servants that would have also could have been upper level slaves, but they were all better off than all of the free people of Egypt. So even if they were servants or slaves for this king, they would have been in a better position than most of the peasants that would have been in Egypt at the time. And so in this case, this idea of servants could have meant the kind of servants that were rulers of the tax farmers in these various regions. And so they were vassals of the king. And so the ruler would send them out to collect taxes for him, even if it was at a profit, but then he demanded efficiency. So if they collected taxes after the harvest, the king would settle their accounts with them afterwards. Many of them were agricultural workers, meaning they themselves would struggle to pay taxes. And in this area, there was a lot of drought. And so the taxes were based on the amount of food or grain or whatever, whatever they were growing. It wasn't necessarily based on how much money they were earning. It was based on how much they were potentially able to produce. And so if there was a drought or it was a bad year, that did not change the amount that they would have been taxed. They would have been taxed on the potential, not necessarily on the net. And so that was really difficult for some people. And so when we're looking at this, we have to think about this fact that $2.5 billion, it's an absorbent amount of money. It didn't even actually make sense. And he's basically exaggerating in this sense to the, use this hyperbole, this literary device to say, okay, this is, it's not about the money. It's just this unthinkable amount of money that, that he was forgiven. And so the point is not about the money because in ancient Israel, remember, who is Jesus talking to? Who were Matthew's original readers? They were people in ancient Israel. In that culture, debt and sin were equal to each other, meaning they considered sin their debt to God. That's what he's getting at. This debt to God that you could never yourself ever repay. That's what this parable is about. And so then in verse 25, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. That was very common for that time frame, not necessarily by Jewish standards, but remember, this is a Gentile king. And so the debtors were often forced to sell their children as slaves or their children were just taken as slaves by whoever they owe the money to. And so that would have been called the debtor slavery. And that was designed both as a punishment and to help recoup some of the costs. And so they typically would not have put women in slavery, but they would have put the men and they would have put the children. And, you know, that actually happens still in many parts of the world today. I've seen it personally with my own eyes. If you didn't listen to my conversation with Jay that aired on Friday, I would encourage you to listen to that because he at nine years old was not the youngest boy in prison. It happens in many parts of the world today. And so it's interesting. It's hard for us to imagine children in prison like that for the debt of their parents, but it is essentially something that did happen and still ha happens today. And so it says that he grabbed him and he began to choke him. And he says, pay back what you owe me. So he's demanding this payment, even though he had just himself been forgiven. And if you use the same figures to understand the equivalency of $2.5 in modern currency, the amount that that second slave owed was just a little over $4,000, which was easily able to be paid back by just working. And so in anger, this master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back this money. You know, what's interesting about that as well is once somebody was put into jail, they really couldn't pay back the money because they couldn't work. And that is another servant of the king. So think about this. In this pre-Roman Egypt Gentile situation, no one could charge a servant of the king, but yet he does it anyway. And so that angers the king. Then the fact that this servant, who is one of his servants, could no longer work, would give further costs to the king, which is going to result in more lost revenue. So he has already forgiven this first servant. And now this first servant has taken away another servant. And it's ridiculous how he forgets all about the grace he's just been given. And he is not acting with mercy at all towards the second one. And it would have been better for that first servant to convince people of the generosity and the grace of the king. But instead, what he did 
is he acted as the king's agent and he did not have mercy on that second servant, which then reflected poorly on the king because he was acting on the behalf of the king. And so that's actually the opposite of the nature and the heart of the king. And I think that says something powerful about us as believers when we don't forgive others, but yet we have received a debt or a forgiveness on a debt that we could never, ever pay back. But yet we're not willing to forgive other people in relationship to what they owe us. It's nowhere near the amount of what God has forgiven us. And then what was the outcome? The outcome was the king got mad and he took that first servant and he put him in jail and it says to be tortured. Now, that was not a Jewish practice by any means, but remember, this is a Gentile king. Herod himself practiced this and other Gentiles did. And then what happens? Well, the king gets angry and he puts this guy, this first guy in jail to be tortured. And while being tortured in jail was not a Jewish practice, it was a Gentile practice. Herod himself practiced that. And so this servant has now fallen from favor of the king. He's been publicly shamed. And now at this point, he would have no friends or no allies to come help pay back that debt. And even if they did have somebody that could do that, he, they could never repay the amount of that debt. So his situation is hopeless. So what's the connection here for us? In verse 35, it says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. See, mercy is not giving a person what he deserves. And grace is giving a person something that he doesn't deserve. Someone that has truly experienced the mercy and the grace of God, they understand what it means and they have this transformed heart that produces a changed life, which also extends mercy and grace. So given that insight, I'm going to go back and I'm going to reread this passage. This is Matthew chapter 18, starting at verse 21. It says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and your sister from your heart. Let's pray. God, we recognize that this sin debt that we had could not be paid back any way, shape, or form other than by the blood of Jesus. God, we thank you that you have cleared that debt out for us. God, help us to have eyes and ears and hearts that recognize that same forgiveness as we interact with those around us. God, help us to walk in a spirit of mercy and grace the way that we have learned from our relationship with you. God, we thank you that you show your grace and your mercy to us over and over, God, even in the moments that we don't even know we've committed yet, because we know that we will. It's part of the reason why we needed we needed Jesus to to pay that debt for us because we're sinful in our hearts. But God, help us to seek to live lives that are full of mercy and grace for those around us. God, it's hard sometimes, but God, would you by your spirit through your word empower us to do the things that you have called us to do? God, I thank you that we don't have to do this alone, that we don't have to live this life alone, but that we can depend on you. We thank you and praise you in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, friends, thanks for listening. Hey friends, as we lean into a new month and we continue to learn and grow together, there's a couple resources I want to make sure you know about so you can take advantage of. The first is our Patreon page and the link for that is in the show notes. And on the Patreon page, we have a couple things. We have a dedicated space that is for discussion, for asking questions. You get easy access to me where we talk about things, we hold each other accountable. 
There are resources that go with the show, like a journaling prompt worksheet download for every single adult show. We also have family discussion guides. And what's really been neat about those is that on the kids show every day, I talk about the same content that's on the adult show, just taught in a way that kids can understand. Then the family discussion guides create an environment for you to process that information with your children. You can use that at the dinner table or even as part of your devotional routine. There's some suggested prayer and activities and things to help you connect that content to the appropriate age for your children. So all of that is on the Patreon. Also, there's some prophetic words, extra videos, transcripts, all those kinds of things. The second is on our website. If you go to shehears.org, there's a shop resources page that has my Bible studies that I've written, links to different journaling Bibles, note-taking Bibles, all sorts of resources to help you grow. And then also on our website, we have the coaching section. If you are finding that you need some spiritual direction or life coaching, that is available for you as well. And that's really good to help you process what you're learning. If you're feeling stuck, if you need to work through something, if something just isn't sitting right, or if you want to teach this content and you need to help develop a plan, I'm available to help you do that as well. Again, all of these are resources to help you grow in your spiritual life and hear God's voice more clearly. I want to take just a second to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership with us on the podcast. If you go to lifeaudio.com, you will find dozens of other faith-centered podcasts in their network. They've got shows about prayer, Bible study, parenting, and more. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you in your walk with God, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, bonus content, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you. Know that you are so loved. Keep going.